Um, thanks everybody for coming here today. Um, so I'll just start by talking about how we imagine the Canadian government as an information infrastructure, one that's attempting to integrate big data analytics into its traditionally bureaucratic practices of producing policy evidence. We might think of it as a culture clash between public servants and the commercial sector analytics specialists inserting themselves into various departments. So I'll let you guess which one of these clip arts comes up from a Google search for bureaucracy versus one for data analytics. And in fact, this narrative that there's an ongoing sort of culture clash here um, between modern tech savvy companies, analysts and their tools versus a slow and reluctant public service is one that's being actively promoted by tech companies themselves. This narrative can be easily, found, easily found across um, both public and private sector discourses, and this is an example from IBM talking about the need for culture changes in government to be able to deal with big data. But is there actually a cult clash in cultures? So our talk today is trying to think about this question by focusing on the particular case of Canadian heritage as a government department, a department that doesn't seem like the most obvious place perhaps, to integrate data analytics. So for those who aren't familiar with Heritage, Heritage is responsible for policies and programs regarding the arts, culture, media, communications, official languages, status of women, sports, and multiculturalism. And its own culture has been one of extensive public consultation and support for community groups in these different cultural sectors. So here's a picture of Minister Melanie Jolie talking with constituents from across the consultations that were conducted a couple of years ago now for the Canadian culture in a digital world. Um, proceeding. But we argue that despite the apparent incongruity of the merger of big data with this sort of version of consultation-based cultural policy, proposals to integrate data analytics as policy evidence and in service management represent a continuity from the increasing managerial culture that marketizes government and renders citizens as consumers. If there is a clash here, the clash is between economic, commercial, and market values and what might be broadly described as social, cultural, and environmental values. Shifting the narrative to examine how datafication contributes to particular types of continuity versus change also leads to questions about what the culture clash narrative itself obscures. So this argument's based on our analysis of a series of documents from Canadian Heritage that were obtained through access to information requests. Joanna filed the request in June of last year asking for all records of big data or data analytics projects or pilot projects. And we read through these, this stack of documents, for indications of how the Department of Heritage is trying to deal with data analytics for what uses and how big data is positioned by the language of the documents. Our main concern is to characterize how data analytics fits into the bureaucratic culture of government policy making. Typically, the bureaucracy of government load is contrasted against the lean and nimble operations of business. However, as David Graeber puts it, the iron law of liberalism dictates that every attempt to reduce government, to deregulate, to promote free market forces over government intervention will have the ironic effect of increasing the total number of regulations and expanding the bureaucratic mechanism. Although they may appear as opposites, the public and private sectors are all part of the same system, where government has adopted bureaucratic techniques directly from the corporate world. In a neoliberal context of financialization, public and private inextricably support each other in the imperative to create wealth from financial speculation. This process is fundamentally bureaucratic, Graeber argues, in that value is derived not from labor, as in Marx's formulation, but from the algorithms and mathematical formulae by which the world comes to be assessed. In this light, <clears throat> data analytics can be seen on a continuum from the neoliberal new public management techniques adopted by governments in the 1980s. New public management, as we know, mixes ideas from corporate management and institutional economics. In new, pub in new public management systems governance, citizens become consumers and government services are marketized through the introduction of competition models and outsourcing. Now it's been argued, and, and this is what kind of what this slide is talking to, this slide is kind of this mixture um, of this kind of consumerized model of citizen, um, new ways that technologies can facilitate this and communication processes can facilitate this, and this kind of um, indication of this categorization of breaking down of the citizen as consumer. So it's been argued that in the 2000s, new public management was dying. 
and being replaced by a new paradigm of digital era governance, and there was hope about how digital era governance would lead to a new cha to a change, a new, a new way of understanding. Um, digital era governance is considered to be leading to more positive changes as governments reintegrate the public sector and embed electronic delivery, this is a quote, and embed electronic deliver delivery at the heart of the government business model. Now, our critique raises questions about how government uses of data actually, in practice, extend new public management programs of marketization, financialization, commercialization, outsourcing, and public-private partnerships. Moreover, the lack of transparency across much of processes of big data analytics as they're being integrated threatens to introduce further biases and systemic discrimination across government policies that already tend to reinforce the marginalization of citizens according to class, race, gender, ability, ethnicity, and other existing social divides. So we notice these themes across the documents obtained from Canadian heritage. Consider, for example, the Government of Canada's Policy Research Group fact sheet on internet governance and big data which outlines the promises of data analytics for policy evidence. Here is how the fact sheet addresses cultural policy. So cultural institutions and funding agencies are using big data to manage their exhibits, visitor services, operation and funding programs. They use GPS systems to follow visitors and push location appropriate content to them in real time. Analyze purchasing data to encourage patrons to buy more items from their online stores and experiment with measuring the reactions of visitors to exhibitions in order to better measure their impact. Funding agencies also sift through analytics on artists to modify their programming. This list of operations and benefits is presented in the language of marketing, where Canadian citizens become visitors and patrons, largely framed through a consumer model that sees them as purchasers of culture as content. Such language offers an instance of what Graeber notes as the continuity between commercial versions of bureaucracy and state bureaucracy under neoliberalism. The transposition of a commercial retail model onto the cultural sector raises concerns about a move toward, quote, producing a museum experience aimed at pleasing the crowd, and away from more challenging and troubling exhibitions of, quote, historical and artistic significance, to quote a museology and conservation newsletter. In addition to this kind of marketization, what this excerpt also betrays is a kind of mystification around big data. The functions of pushing location-appropriate content and measuring the reactions of visitors sound almost magical. This kind of faith in analytics as a sort of techno-fetishism further manifests in Canadian Heritage's proposal to the Information Fund to integrate social media in particular as a line of evidence for assessing their programs. Here, social media seems to offer a ready-made pool of evidence that will, quote, generate efficiencies in a cost-effective manner. And this is not necessarily a new idea to Heritage. This was reported on years ago by the Toronto Star for the government at large. But this idea of using social media for something that's cheaper, a cheaper line of evidence than the department's typical administration of large-scale surveys and consultations is what we'd like to note here. This shift shows how the notion of evidence is getting reconfigured through practices that avoid deliberative public participation altogether. The lack of transparency endemic to the uses of proprietary social media data mean that inequalities in policymaking can be even more deeply reified seemingly automatically. The problems of discriminatory analytics are barely mentioned across the documents that we analyzed. Instead, the efficiency promise of data analytics is reiterated in a way that harnesses new public management rhetoric within the newer paradigm of digital era governance. Heritage's efforts to update managerialism in light of analytics is apparent in the three separate primers in this document on what is big data. Like, nobody knows. <laughs> These primers are great for explaining that big data can be interrogated to discover insights, wow, to improve efficiency, identify new opportunities, provide customers with better products and services, and predict future patterns of behavior. Such insights can be gleaned from readily available conversation and visual data from social media posts, including things like LinkedIn profiles. I have no idea what they're doing with that. <laughs> this idea of a kind of post-demographic analysis is of course at the core of the social media marketing models we're familiar with, and Canadian heritage makes a specific note of Netflix's global algorithm that, quote, allows for expansion to be guided by proprietary signals. Hmm. This kind of hype around post-demographics thus entails submitting to an industry version of non-transparent proprietary algorithms. So consider the language that summarizes why big data even matters at all to gov government. Here's a quote, I'll read it, it's a bit small. Big data provides the opportunity to customize service to better meet an individual's preferences and needs. 
Getting big data right will facilitate ways of improving performance and productivity and create new wealth for shareholders and stakeholders. Wow. This assertion from a government document was lifted almost word for word from a big data report prepared by, for finance professionals by the Global Association of Chartered Certified Accountants. So this is where they're getting their models for big data governance. And this kind of new public management tinged language of a statement like this and others across the big data primers is telling, both for the role of data analytics in furthering the marketization of government as a wealth generator, as per Graver's formulation, as well as for the apparent lack of clarity on what exactly big data analytics entails in government specifically. The need for so many primers at all suggests that the department does not have any internal expertise in data analytics and that there's a kind of willingness to keep it that way. Big data appears to fulfill the efficiency promised by a new public management through contracting out analytics to commercial firms, meaning that there's no impetus for public transparency about how data gets collected and interpreted. So to sum up, what we're seeing is that the values that are emphasized in big data discussions within government documents are the same or congruent with those that are ongoing in the private sector, that there's a dominance of market-based values. However, there's, a, there's an ongoing narrative of culture clash, this idea that there is a culture clash between the government, between public and private sectors. That narrative is, act is actively being promoted. In the May 2016 Understanding Big Data Policy Research Group document, which we which we received in our, um, from our request, two of the big data challenges identified come directly from IBM sources who, quote, identify the need for an evidence-based culture and a data-driven mindset, as, you know, insinuating that doesn't already exist within government, and also, quote, the, ch the need for changing an organization's culture to embrace analytics and adopt a big data strategy. Um, so you can see here we're turning here to the IBM Center um, for the Business of Government, identifying that, that within this location, you know, this, this, this IBM expert can discuss some of the best practices that leaders can apply to change the organization's analytic and big data culture. So like all good myths, there is some truth about differences in culture. Of course, as government makes more use of big data systems, there are changing power dynamics at play. Our point is that changing power dynamics um, are not being talked about that in, in a way that accurately reflects what's actually going on in these competitions or these, these changes that are, that are um, happening as the big data approaches get integrated. There are changes in data literacy issues. There are challenges in terms of data literacy issues and changes in information systems and practices. But the promotion of the overly simplified idea that greater data integration requires a change in government culture masks the complicated reality of the limits and risks that come with big data, which surface tangentially across all access information requests that we got back in return. So in contrast, what is needed or more is actually what we argue is more active encouragement and engagement with those who are challenging these big data systems, those within government who are saying, wait a second, hold on, and maybe there are some issues we need to attend to here, instead of just uh, dismissing these concerns as if it's somehow re reducible only to a clash in government cultures. Um, so to conclude, when examining how Canadian heritage is working, to implement data analytics, the consumption model of culture where citizens are framed in neoliberal terms as individuals participating in a marketplace for culture serves as the key framework for contemporary policy making. The efforts of Heritage Minister Melanie Jolie to modernize the department since 2015 have revolved around the digital transformation of culture under the banner of discoverability. Discoverability means making Canadian cultural products attractive to consumers at home and abroad in a time of internet overabundance. This focus on the digital discoverability of Canadian cultural products marks a shift away from more traditional public values such as sovereignty, support for the arts, and citizen participation. In this sense, there is a kind of culture clash at the heart of strategies to implement data analytics in government. Yeah, but in a broader way, the idea of a clash is um, a bit of a concealment. So you can see, for example, from this absolutely hideous slide from mm -hmm. Shared Services Canada, <coughs> But the way that they're trying to implement big data is basically meaningless. So you have these two word clouds, okay, word clouds <laughs> in both official languages underneath the heading service, innovation, value. This is a kind of direct continuity that we're seeing from a new public management managerial culture version of government that's just like adding big data as word clouds. It's like completely meaningless. 
Okay, so, but in another sense, the idea of the culture clash is itself a mask that conceals just how continuous, as Tamara was saying, the logic of data analytics is with new public management strategies endemic to neoliberal governmentality and the iron law of liberalism. So our questions, to conclude, revolve around how to integrate data analytics among a host of other strategies for redressing the discriminatory and marginalizing impacts of policymaking that doesn't fully consider public needs. Where can we find examples of governments going against the grain of managerialism and actually learning from social inequalities? Some government departments and agencies, such as Statistics Canada, are clearly interrogating and challenging some of these um, some of these myths and the limits um, of data analytics. How might processes of interrogation and learning be shared to move beyond data hype and myths? How are governments able to use various strategies, including data analytics, to integrate feedback from groups they normally don't get feedback from? How can policymakers listen to people on the ground to find out the ways that they are being marginalized? Finally, just as a closing note, a detailed assessment of how government departments are making use of big data had to be gained through filing access to information requests. This is a problem, and if we want more transparency, if we want more informed debate, if we want to actually have a nuanced discussion about the limits that come with big data, we need to have a bigger, broader, challenging, complicated discussion. Thanks very much. So this presentation, to quote uh, feminist geographer Jillian Rose, is written from a sense of failure. More specifically, I'm campaigning here for what I've termed as a methodology of failure, a, strat a strategy excuse me, for, under for misunderstanding uh, big data in an effort to dislodge epistemological and ontological assumptions that sustain it. This requires first a breakdown in what we think we know about big data. So failure here takes root in Jack Halberstam's cultivation of a concept of failure, which is aimed at deliberately failing to succeed in meeting masculine heterosexual social standards. Such failures can, in fact, offer unexpected pleasures and generate radical visions for alternative futures. What if we were to relearn big data, um, and not by what it can do or by what it promises to do, but through what it fails to do? So these failures are the moments in which the infrastructure reveals itself. Our suspension of disbelief is paused and we no longer are subdued by computational power and logic. These instances, though seemingly mundane, offer a glimpse into the infrastructure at work. Lisa Parks, for instance, describes similar encounters with stuff you can kick, and I'm interested in the stuff you can't kick, the supporting acts and gestures that are in fact material, but are sequestered virtually. So critical methodology of failure, and this is new and I'm working through it, so I, I look forward to all of your comments and questions, um, seeks out these uninspirational moments from the contemporary past to reimagine a queer futurity of data. So this methodology, therefore, is assembled in a twofold manner. First, there are those uninspirational moments, the traces of a supporting act or gesture that are easily dismissed as a glitch or an error. For instance, many of us in our Google Book travels have come across, come across excuse me, an inspirational moment. It often looks like something like this, or might appear as a page scanned through tissue paper, a page scanned while mid-turn, or a fold-out map and diagram scanned while folded. At most, these are minor annoyances and possibly impediments to accessing information. There are, however, other kinds of errors, too, like this, a glitch that um, reveals to us a human presence, which I don't know if you can see, but there's a human presence, um, or a partial perspective of the human presence, gloved fingertips, a severed hand. In 2007, when Andrew Norman Wilson was contracted by a video production company to work on the Google campus, he noticed how every day at 2.15 p.m. outside of the building next to his, the same group of workers, mostly black and Latino, left campus in unison like clockwork. Instead of getting into Google shuttles like other employees, they would get into their own cars. And they wore yellow badges, a color Wilson had not yet noticed amongst the white badges of full-timers, the red badges of contractors, and the green badges of the interns. And by his own account, Wilson started to obsess a little and began mining all of the information about the yellow badge workers he could find from uh, Google's intranet. He discovered the internal name for this class of workers, ScanOps. 
and he came across vague meeting notes about how the group was excluded from the standard privileges at the Googleplex, like the shuttles, bikes, cafes, and access to other buildings. And such practices or perks, as Wilson has explained, you know, they, they do reflect the hierarchical organization at a corporate multinational. But it was the secrecy in which the scan ops worked and the privileges they were denied that were perhaps most telling. The yellow badge signified not worth the price of integration. And Wilson continued observing the daily rhythms of the yellow badge workers, eventually filming their daily routines. Um, and he has a short film, Workers Leaving the Googleplex, which is a reference to the Lumiere Brothers 1895 film, Workers Leaving a Factory, um, which is the first in two Google Focus projects. The second, which is the scan ops, um, is an ongoing photographic project that collects the errors, glitches, and mistakes made in the process of scanning books. And here we see images of disembodied, anonymous, often feminine, brown, or black hands. So I'm in the process of reading this glitch archive, for lack of a better term, according to what uh, Jose Esteban Munoz refers to as ephemera as trace, um, which he defines as the remains, the things that are left hanging in the air like a rumor. Munoz, of course, employs this concept um, to express the vexed relationship queerness has to evidence. Historically, evidence has been used to punish and discipline queer modes of being, feeling, and thinking. So I'm not suggesting that we read these as queer gestures. Rather, Munoz's framing might enable us to misinterpret these acts and gestures, to misinterpret, excuse me, how these acts and gestures queer what is ostensibly component parts in a big data infrastructure and render strange what we're asked to embrace as fail-safe, a system unerring, efficient, accurate, and above all else, a system devoid of human presence. So mundane and extraordinary, the Google Book glitches are the ephem ephemeral traces of a gesture, which could so easily be dismissed as simply a glitch or error. Indeed, it is the glitch itself that enables us to see the gesture. What is queer here then in following Munoz is how the visible evidence of the human as it exists in traces, glimmers, residues, and specks of things is enduring. These gestures summon the invisible work marginalized groups have performed throughout the history of computing. And although she's not in this room, Sarah uh, Roberts' work, I think this speaks in dialogue with um, her work of consequence, her research of consequence, excuse me, throughout the history of computing. Gestures, write Munoz, transmit ephemeral knowledge of lost histories and possibilities within a phobic majoritarian culture. Oops. The severed hand, reflects Joseph Yanelli, is the embodiment of a history. These amputated hands, much like those invisible and glaring traces found in microfilm, are in an instant the invisible hand of the market laid bare. Thus, interpreting these physical traces, first as a kind of failure in the digitization process, and then reading these glitches from a purview of ephemera as trace, atomizes movement, the movement of bodies, the history of computing, and the backstage supporting acts of digital culture writ large. And perhaps then, we might start to respond to Sophia Moja Noble's call for modes of analysis that foreground how white supremacy structures the internet as we know it in the West, and that links the processes and structures of hegemony, imperialism, and power to the material implications of the project we know as the internet. The second component uh, in a methodology of failure is the act of reimagining re a queer futurity of data. So generally, when we talk about the future, we invoke a linearity or temporality that protra protracts the past and present into um, the future. So the problem with such an imagining of the future is that it merely reproduces what already exists and persists. In No Future, Queer Theory and the Death Drive, Lee Edelman repudiates futurity and contemporary politics, arguing how both are fettered to a heteronormative logic of what he calls reproductive futurism. And for Edelman, this entails surrender, surrendering the present for a future embedded in the logic of a narrative wherein history unfolds as the future envisioned for a child who must never grow up. So let us, I want to pause momentarily and consider um, data in the way that Edelman conceives of, of the child. On February 17th, uh, Mark Zuckerberg published um, his, now I'm sure everyone in this room knows, the uh, five 1,800 word Facebook post updating the company's mission and pronouncing its future. 
In short, Zuckerberg's declaration outlines the ways in which Facebook will foster a future through, quote, a global infrastructure that works for everyone. And to fully understand this post, I think two key threads need frame. So the first con concerns um, a rhetorical shift. So Facebook is so clearly divorcing itself from a term it has become synonymous with, which we know, the social network. And in its vacancy, we encounter social infrastructure. So the rhetorical shift from network to infrastructure aligns neatly with Facebook's long-term goal, which is to say Facebook is no longer invested in serving as a network, right? It Rather, it wants to be the network. It wants to become the internet, or at the very least, a kind of internet through which people using Facebook's internet.org dot org, excuse me, program would only be permitted to use online services chosen by Facebook. Hence the rhetorical shift from network as a marker of a platform to infrastructure as really a means of conflating Facebook with the internet echoes Facebook's corporate agenda. This investment uh, in the future of and through the social infrastructure works to uphold what already exists. Right? And it's not merely the internet, again, but what Andre Brock has identified as the social structure of the Western internet, that which represents and maintains the normalization of white, masculine, bourgeois, heterosexual, and Christian culture through its content. So if we rely on these kinds of past models to help shape the future, then we ought to draw out the material consequences of oppression, or we risk continuously reproducing processes and structures of hegemony, imperialism, and power. But the second thread that needs unraveling and it gets to data is that which is invoked through its glaring absence, which is uh, data. Um, so Facebook's renewed focus on, quote, developing the social infrastructure for community seeks to foster a global community that is supportive, safe, informed, civically engaged, and inclusive. So this is a radically optimistic and persuasive agenda, and if one were to invest solely in the description of this social infrastructure so tightly bound to efforts at community building, then one might be able, excuse me, then one might not be compelled to consider how, in fact, Facebook will do this. So for instance, Zuckerberg describes the capacity to, quote, prevent harm, end quote, by building social infrastructure to help our community identify problems before they happen. So omitted from this sanguine narrative uh, which demarcates the future of the social infrastructure is any mention whatsoever of data as its key asset, right? The basic work as we know that Facebook does is to collect data and to hold on to it for a long time, if not forever. I mean, we don't know, it's questionable, but possibly forever. Thus, the future conjured up for us by Facebook necessitates data, though it's not once referenced. So such a vision of the future is structurally speculative or what Claire Birchall describes as the uses to which collected data will be put and the meanings it will be given are dependent on future algorithms and political concerns. So the bias of communication is no longer stalled in what Harold Innes describes as a state of present mindedness. Rather, we are hooked into a kind of reproductive data futurism. So data, much like the figure of the child evoked by Edelman, is a political trope. If the future in reproductive futurism is defined by a present heteronormative social order, and if it must be protected and safeguarded because it is the space the child will inhabit in order to actualize and impart uh, meaning on the reproductive logic of the present, then the future in reproductive data futurism is defined by a techno-social order that must be preserved and defended because it is the space in which data will be anchored to reaffirm our logic of the present. So if we invest in Zuckerberg's re reproductive futurism, for instance, in regards to predictive software helping to make society safer, then we unwillingly submit to Facebook's always changing practices on how it collects and what it does with our data. And if we convince ourselves that the future Facebook suggests we want indeed is indeed the future we so desire, they are, we are more able to push aside any concerns we may have by virtue of our investment in this kind of futurism. So I'm hoping, as, as this work progresses, that through a lens of cute, queer futurity of data, we might start to scramble the linear developmental temporality of a kind of reproductive data futurism. So the demand placed on queerness in this sense is to rebuff reproductive data futurism and to undermine the social structure of the Western internet. Indeed, this social structure is precisely embraced and upheld by Zuckerberg's manifesto. 
Facebook's CSR strategy, writes Tamara Shepard, now involves positioning itself as an actor with a worldwide vantage point, conflating its US-based culturally imperialistic perspective, sitting here in California, with a global us. Thus, Facebook's corporate social responsibility ethos, as charted by Zuckerberg's manifesto, unwittingly leaks to us its neocolonial plan. So a methodology of failure is invested in unknowing what we think we might know about big data. What, we, what might we glean from moments of rupture or breakdown, these accidental and unplanned instances in which we are afforded a peak, a peak of big data's underbelly, which uh, reference here Mel Hogan's work. The, failing, uh, the failings of big data exist as glitches and fleeting moments, revealed only when a subordinate part in a much larger integra integrated system fails. So I'm seeking to uncover these alternative realities of big data by unearthing who and what is subsumed by, hidden, or baked into big data infrastructures, and how these are purposefully obscured for, from view. So I propose that we seek these out as an interpretive method through which we might start to respond to the questions, who is operating the system, and to whom does this system belong? primarily focuses on software, and so I spend most of my time thinking about software design. How is software programmed? Why do programmers make particular choices? How do these choices shift as the software continues to be updated? I've been mostly interested in identity-based programming practices, so consider gender. Um, how is it coded? Is it a radio button? Is it a drop-down list, a text box? Is it only the binary, male or female? Um, are there more options for non-binary users? Is it mandatory, not mandatory? Is there nowhere that gender seems to appear on the software? Is gender categorized differently in the database versus the user interface versus the advertiser interface? So I've been writing about identity-based programming practices in social media platforms and mobile phone apps related to issues ranging from gender to sexual violence prevention to nonprofits seeking social change, um, and even most recently a dating app called Bumble. Um, but since this is mainly a theoretical talk today, I'll only speak about one of these studies briefly at the end. So these studies have led me to engage with a lot of work relating to categorization or classification systems, so ranging from Jeffrey Bowker and Susan Lee Starr's work to Lisa Nakamura's. Um, also Simone Brown and Kim Talbert's work has been important drawing out the racial and colonial histories extended to contemporary <laughs> categorization schemas and of course the governance and surveillance practices they engender. Um, meanwhile, there's critical trans scholars like Susan Stryker, Misha Cardenas, who refuse and renegotiate categories. Of course, you have Kimberly Crenshaw, Jasper Poor's work, that draws our attention to the intersection and assemblage of identities. And the critiques of normativity and static identities are really crucial here too. So queer scholars, again, like Lee Edelman, um, and critical disability scholars like Rosemary Garland Thompson have been pretty crucial to my thinking. But alongside categories and identities, I've been thinking about the effects of programming practices. So Sophia Noble's work on Google has been pretty helpful in understanding how software can structure power and values. For instance, in the commodified and pornified representations of women of color produced by search engines, and more broadly, the reinforcement of racism through algorithms. Um, John Cheney Lippold's work has also been really useful with respect to algorithmic forms of identity and what he calls the new computational index for meaning that's produced by algorithms. Uh, he talks about identity categories like race, where he, that he puts in quotation marks, versus race without quotation marks, um, that are both separate and connected. So identity categories here seem to multiply and separate with different ontological structures generated in both machinic and non-machinic locations. And the different ontological rendering of identity-based meaning in software relates in part to the conditions for existence in computer programming languages. 
So here, a drawn work from Wendy Chun, David Berry, Paul Dorish, Jason Farman, also from Human Computer Interaction, Shawan Barzell, has influenced my thinking, especially when she warns that software design can, quote, make us become the kind of user the software is for. Bracketing aside the rest of ourselves that is not relevant to the software. Now ultimately, what I'm working towards here is a desire. I want to reframe the work of software and our relations with it. And so to this end, my central argument here is that understanding software as social infrastructure can open up new possibilities for our relationship with it. Now I was going to bracket aside Facebook and what uh, Andrew Zafira was just talking about there. I will talk about Facebook later, but there is interesting connections that we can get to later on if we like. Now, software isn't social infrastructure in the sense that it functions in isolation. Following Susan Lee Starr and Karen Ruleder's work, it'd be more precise to say that social infrastructure is something that emerges alongside other forces and actors and relations. So in this sense, of course, infrastructures are fundamentally relational. Yet still, I am arguing that software is social infrastructure. So my intention here is to magnify software's role in building our social worlds, compel us to be more attentive to it, and recognize our stake in its design. Now, before I work through what I mean by social infrastructure and offer that example of software in action, I want to underscore why I think it's really important to imagine software like this to disrupt and extend how we see, think, and respond to software. So in a very different context, unrelated to software, queer theorist Eve Sedgwick critiqued cultural studies scholars for their suspicious outlook, focusing on identifying problems and pointing them out. So she calls this a paranoid reading. So here, the scholar excavates hidden violence in a text in some paranoid compulsion to avoid negative affect by exposing it. So Cedric urges us instead to be more conscious of how we are producing knowledge as scholars. Instead, she proposes a reparative reading. So this time, the scholar works to build new relations among concepts and ideas, to produce new ways of seeing and understanding while being more open to a different range of affects, perhaps even those with more positive connotations. And so my argument that software is social infrastructure seeks out new connections by aspiring to repair our understanding of what software does so that we can participate anew in its design. Now, when Lisa Parks and Nicole Starozelski introduced us to media infrastructures in their book, Signal Traffic. They asked what media and communication studies can gain by adopting an infrastructural disposition. And one of the benefits they mention is an opportunity to think about why the public is not very involved in the development, regulation, and use of infrastructure. So certainly this is something that's a central concern for my work here. How do we recast software in a way that brings the public closer to it? We have technical experts, engineers, programmers, and the like who often have trouble seeing the social implications of software. And we have those members of the public with limited or maybe no technical expertise who end up alienated from the inner workings of software. There's also limited public understanding of the social implications, or as John Cheney Lippold has argued, the ways in, our, in which our lives are regulated by algorithmic processes without our direct participation or realization. So he's talking here about a soft biopolitics or a form of indirect control. But perhaps these boundaries of expertise are productive in so much as they disconnect the public, permitting software to function as social infrastructure under the radar. So drawing on Lucy Sukman's work here, we could say that these like contests and alliances 
make technical systems possible. Now by focusing on media infrastructures, Parks and Starzelski choose to foreground distribution processes. Alternatively, I'm looking at social infrastructures here and foregrounding software programming practices because I want to understand how software participates in generating the infrastructure that becomes or can become the social. Now in this reading, the social is more in line with probably Bruno Latour's understanding of the social. Like, it's what is glued together. So it's, the social isn't a particular type of thing, but it's a type of connection between heterogeneous elements that might be assembled anew in some other given state of affairs. And that's what the social is. Okay, I filled you in as much as I can right now on where I'm coming from, and now it's time for a specific example. Um, and it's one that I draw on a lot here. But in this investigation um, of the 10-year history of Facebook's coding practices, I was able to show how software translates and morphs our identities into multiple layers, not all of which are accessible or knowable to us, even as they explicitly are made available for others to use and for the company to profit from. So over time, Facebook moved from an optional gender field on original profile pages back in 2004 to imposing a mandatory binary male-female gender in 2008 to eventually introducing custom gender in 2014 and then a free-form text field later on in 2015. But at the same time, the software began to embrace this non-binary identification. At the same time, it was also programmed to revert a user's gender back to a binary within the software's database. So my findings indicated that the gender, thank you, stored for a user in the software's database is based exclusively on the pronoun they select. So this means that some users, let's say, who select gender questioning and then the pronoun she, will be quietly misgendered by the software with female appearing in the database. So by using a pronoun to translate a user's gender into data, the company only partially modified gender. And they did it to maintain relations with third-party clients like advertisers and developers who regularly access Facebook's database where this information is stored. When I interviewed one of the developers, they said they didn't want to break the product. Now ultimately, um, I ended up seeing this as an increasingly sophisticated form of camouflage. Programming software to absorb critiques from marginalized groups only to reflect them back superficially while simultaneously concealing and further entrenching their own systems of categorization and regulation. But Facebook software is programmed to produce different identity categories for different groups of users or clients. So in these moments, the user becomes part of a social infrastructure in which non-normative identity is permitted, made visible, perhaps even pleasurable to broadcast. For the advertisers and other third-party interlocutors, the social infrastructure they become part of is narrowed. Progressive movements made within surface layers of the software can be partitioned from other software layers. So more than one social infrastructure can be generated by the same software. The identity of actors can be altered depending on the different assembly of people, software processes, and any other elements that bring them together. This is the capacity of software as social infrastructure. So to conclude, let's recall my argument here. Um, and again, feedback, very welcome. Um, understanding software as social infrastructure or imagining software as social infrastructure can open up new possibilities for our relationship with it. And let's recall that infrastructures are fundamentally relational. 
for me, this perspective corresponds with Karen Barad's view of the world as emergent. So as a queer theorist and quantum physicist, Barad sees the world as always in a process of becoming. What we observe depends on the apparatuses we set up to make sense of it. So if I extend these ideas, then I can observe, thank you, that a specific social infrastructure is generated for me when I'm making a connection with a software program like Facebook. And if we choose to understand software as social infrastructure, we can observe that software does not emerge in isolation. It requires other relations to come into being. Now we can begin to imagine that software needs us. We help generate software because it requires a social infrastructure to exist. So in this way, software is social infrastructure at the same time as it produces social infrastructure. And through this logic, we can make decisions about software design, and perhaps we are responsible for them. Thank you. When your trans girlfriend asks you to walk down the street to get a pack of smokes with her, please go. Maybe not all girls like me have the same request. Some tea girls can stomp their way over with a paramount shield of confidence that can split the eye that scorns her. But some of us, some of me, can't bear to pass through the front door on my own. In this body I've struggled to design, to be confronted with the consequences found in the public realm. We trudge valiantly through frightful avenues where violence against not gender non-conforming people is frequent and foreboding, keeping us explicitly at risk. See me through what seems like minor hazards to you, because alone on my own, I know well where the disaster begins. There are no hands strong enough to wring out this swollen paranoia that consumes my psyche. When there are institutions of fear and rage imperiously prescribed to antagonize my existence, my need to move autonomously, and my safety to grow. We live these complications not as a choice, and it shouldn't depend on me having to dress in appropriate attire or present a comprehensible gender before I go out. No matter what we look like or what we put forth, we won't be ignorant of the terror we have reluctantly come to learn. This, at times, useful terror waxes and wanes in rhythm with the rise and plummet of my chest. I trust it when it rings. I loathe your earnest statement as to how things would have been fine if I had just gone out earlier in the day before I shaved my scruff and painted my face. You say I have the option to wear baggier clothes, deepen my voice, and rehearse some type of discreet performance when planning my moments of survival. But why should I choose this kind of death? Why retreat into what kills me? Mortality has its many forms, and the whirlwind of doubt that swarms my body promises a future etched with material demise. Allies, or whatever position you believe you've assumed, relieve us of these grand expectations about safety. I wish I could carve these apparitions of text onto all of your bodies and allow them to sink in the way that this anxious stupor has caused me to write them has sunken into me. As cisgender women, you're susceptible to similar forms of violence, and we crave the ability to relate our stories to each other and find some sort of calm when doing so. The hard part is acknowledging the painful divisions and subtle differences between us that exacerbate my feelings of alienation when I place your image next to mine. Don't flaw my logic when I plead for your accompaniment to the dissonant tunes of my menial ventures. Let's prevent any casualty of this sort by allowing each other to be honest when asking for support. What I fear is no more important than what you do, but the patterns that make me up are more vulnerable to the distortions caused by those who hold the power to give names. Though you have psychically trimmed the hegemonic gendering imposed on my body, there are stronger currents that rupture our ties, complicating my trust in how you perceive me. I refuse to abide by this disconnect, and I hope you can meet me where the horizon is bare. 
We need to share the tools that we've gathered for our survival. I want to give you the shards of glass I breathe with every breath to enhance your perception of my request. Once you taste the blood that coats my tongue, you can take off your shoes. Step into mine so you can use your own as weapons. Walk me down the street and stand there with me while the guy at the counter who can't tell if he wants to fuck me or kill me makes his purchase and leaves. Use what you know, whatever it is, your militancy or your humor or a combination of both, be there for me. I promise that I will continue to do the same for you. This is a piece by um, Sepan Mashiov, and it's a it's a what she calls a shout to sissy girls. And come on, next one, <laughs> next slide. All right. <clears throat> the contemporary ethics of care emerges from work initially undertaken in the 1980s onward, <clears throat> particularly that of feminist psychology, sociology, and cultural studies. While grounded in the ethnographic work of Carol Gilligan and Norman K. Denzin, among others, today's ethics of care finds more mature expression in the focus found in research by, let's say, Angela McRobie, a lot of the people who've been mentioned today, an anthology of feminist approaches to ethics offered by Tina Miller, Maxine Birch, Melanie Malovner, and Julie Jessup, or through co collective interventions, such as the call for slow scholarship by Alison Mounts, Ann Bonds, Becky Mansfield, Jenna Lloyd, Jennifer Heinemann, Margaret Wolfen Roberts, Ren Basu, Risa Whitson, Whitson, Roberta Hawkins, Trina Hamilton, and Winifred Curran for the call of action I just read to you. Such interventions emphasize the integrated nature of a revised ethics of care. Key components include feminist values such as identifying and respecting diversity, paying attention to how our research may affect those under study, and articulating and acknowledging our intent as researchers and participants, including whether and how we aim to generate potentially transformative engagements. Some convincingly argue that present day approaches to an ethics of care is built on three formative processes, representing women across colonial, I'm gonna just advance it because it seems to have lost its efforts. Um, oops, don't you love it when you Exit right out of your school. Right. First, representing women across colonial, developing and indigenous points of view and experiences, facilitating practices of care, such as initiating personal change through action research and or deconstructing and undermining knowledge structures. It's also explicated through professional standards, such as those developed by the Association of Internet Researchers, respecting qualitative and quantitative data sets, and it often appears as a foundation for research justice methodologies um, that reveal and support social change, generatively queering the research endeavor. A feminist ethics of care can help us to better understand data as a humanly constructed artifact, shaped by power relationships and crafted according to certain values, standpoints, and commitments including our and those of our participants, partners, and others involved in the research process, the social infrastructure. To that point, I offer a cautionary tale. The phrase cooking data is often used in research environments. In Jeffrey Bowker's work on science, memory, and infrastructure, he famously stated that, quote, raw data is both an oxymoron and a bad idea. To the contrary, data should be cooked with care, end quote. In other words, as Lisa Giegelman demonstrates, data take different forms and have different pronunciations, values, depending on disciplinary gazes. A telling parallel exists for me between the idea of cooking the data and the idiom of cooking the books, a method of unethically altering financials and facts to specific advantage. Each perspective is influenced by methodological preferences, dominant epistemologies, as well as funding sources and potentially ethics review board biases in the context of academic work. That's not all, though. Melanie Mouthner, among others, describes the increasing tension between maintaining confidentiality of data and the growing number of public funders that require researchers to make big data shareable. This is problematic for sensitive or power-laden research and what research is not as well as for the development of long-term relationships with participants, communities, 
and organizations. In this context, I argue alongside Cecilia Asberg, Catherine Thiel, and Iris Vandertween that speculation is both a way to think through multiple and sometimes contradictory ways to understand or address an issue and an optimistic gesture that can imagine alternative sets of social relations. A feminist materialism can help ensure a more ethical and inclusive approach to examining data. Such a methodological approach allows the object of study to re-become not simply a subject, a significant shift in itself in relation to others, but also a participant in the real world. That's a whole sentence I would unpack in 20 minutes. Enabling the researcher to acknowledge their own role in shaping the research itself helps to rethink how object-oriented ontologies work in the real world of people and things, generating fluid but still materialist situated knowledges. And by situated knowledges, I'm referring to Haraway's critique of the notion of a singular unified knowledge accepted and promoted by those in privileged positions and her call still relevant today for scholarly research to give us the ability, quote, the ability to partially translate knowledges among very different and power differentiated communities and food. Asberg, Thiel, and Vandertween suggest that feminism can usefully reconceive speculation as method rather than ontology per se. They accomplish this in five stages. First, they, demonstrate, they establish the importance of recognizing how knowledge is co-constituted at every turn. Secondly, they demonstrate how speculation can be mobilized as method, connecting speculation to action and practice, speculation as action. Third, they connect speculation as method to practices of care via the incorporation of feminist theory about situated knowledge that aims to unpack the biases implicit in how we think and how we make decisions. That is, how we frame data collection. The fourth stage calls on all of us as researchers to become more skilled at working within contextual circumstances to develop usefully situated knowledges. And lastly, they reassert the importance of understanding societal power relations breaking down the dominance of binary categories and essentialized knowledge. They belie the tendency in research to pinpoint how you are either this or that, or in the language of data, a one or a zero for now and for all time. Let me unpack this just a little more. A feminist materialist approach of this nature challenges a common materialist assumption that each object of study has an absolutist essence and that we can know that essence by breaking down objects into smaller, more discrete pieces of isolated and comprehensible data. Asberg et al. suggests that we cannot do so without understanding the relationship of such objects to human subjects or participants in part because how we are and who we are changes over time and in various circumstances. They argue that key triple O researchers attempt to explain the world by using speculation as a theoretical tool, building on questionable assumptions about objects of study, rather than mobilizing methods speculatively to contextualize objects, subjects, or participants of study every time. In an essentialized, consumer-driven, corporatized academic environment and big data era, thinking that objects have a comprehensible, stable essence is appealing, as it means that we can parse audiences and communities into market segments and simply match them to the most appropriate products for consumption. It doesn't, however, reflect the world that we live in. So I just want to wrap up by giving you quickly a, cu a couple of projects that I'm involved in that aim to embody this kind of feminist ethics of care in methodological and theoretical um, terms. <clears throat> You've just been looking at images with work from work that I do with my artist group, Narratives in Space and Time Society, to address inequities in regional histories, geographies, social issues, and urban-rural development. For the last three and a half years, we've concentrated on the impending centenary of the devastating Halifax explosion of 1917, which killed or injured more than 10% of the population at the time, redrew the shoreline, and remapped social relations to this day. We mobilized uh, established public art methods of walking, shared story collection, and performances to work with more than 60 collaborators, thank you, and expand these methods significantly through computer-assisted GIS mapping, the tracking of weather conditions, and the shifts in the shoreline, digital tracking of our walks, augmented reality experiences, and related urban development research. 
Our, wo our work culminates this year in two exhibitions, including workshops, readings, and the testing of a mobile software app that encourages remaking the city again through UGC user-generated content together. And a final nod to the Fourchettes Network, which is the foundation of this panel, and which developed the Critical Methods in Technoculture seminar series this past year, enacting a feminist ethics of care. The network includes members of this panel and other emerging scholars, some of whom are in the room. But it, um, our public phase involved 12 seminars on critical data collection and management, funded by SHRC and involving more than 400 people at a number of universities over the past year in Canada, the US, Germany, and England. But behind the scenes work included six planning and working sessions among network members and was kicked off by leveraging Tamara Shepard's startup funding into a connection grant for which I was PI. And that leveraging piece is really important. Tamara's initial desire to see a working relationship in this, in this area of inquiry is now evolving into an innovative digital publication, a whole bunch of research strategies, um, all of it based on our experiences and how they intersect. Um, and we welcome you asking us about it. Thank you very much.